So hello, everybody. Welcome to the Technovation webinar series. We have with us today Debbie Sterling of Goldie Blocks, a really cool game. And she is going to be talking to us today about product development and MVP, so minimal, vi minimal viable product. And we're really excited to have you guys here. So I see that we have people in our audience from India, Vancouver, from Mexico, from the US. So that's really great. And we also have coaches and students and mentors. So we have a nice variety of people to talk and ask good questions later on. So um, Debbie Sterling, who I'll just introduce briefly, is the, co the founder and CEO of Goldie Blocks, which is an award-winning company on a mission to disrupt the pink aisle with toys, games, and media for girls. And so you know who I am. I'm your co-host. My name is Amy Gardner, and I'm the Techno Technovation Director of Curriculum. And I'm really excited to have Debbie Sterling here. So to give you guys just a little bit of background about Debbie, she's an engineer, an entrepreneur, and one of the leaders in the movement toward getting girls interested in science, tech, engineering, and math. She was named Time's Person of the Moment, Business Insider's 30 Women Who Are Changing the World, and was recently added to Fortune Magazine's 40 Under 40 list. So that's a lot of numbers. In early 2015, she was inducted as a presidential ambassador for global entrepreneurship and honored by the National Women's History Museum with a Living Legacy Award for her work to empower girls around the world. Debbie received her degree in engineering at Stanford in 20, 2005. So for those of you who might be unfamiliar, uh, Gully Blocks has been selling a series of construction sets designed to appeal to girls' interests and help them build machines that move and spin. There's also an iOS app called Goldie Blocks on the Movie Machine, which works as a way to engage with the Goldie Blocks brand as a standalone experience, but also ties in with the company's physical toys by allowing kids to create 12 frame animated GIFs, print out their animations and other creations, and then use those cards along with the real world toys. So Debbie's with us today, and she's going to give us the kind of inside scoop on what inspired her to create Goldie Blocks, what the product development process was like for her. She's even shared some of her prototype images with us, so that's pretty great. And then she'll talk about minimum viable product, or MVP, as we might be calling it. Um, some of you students and your coaches and mentors are probably in the middle of the tech innovation curriculum right now. So this is a really great time for us to be talking about this stuff. And we're hoping that you're working on making improvements to your prototypes. And you might be thinking also about the branding of your apps. So after we hear a little bit from Debbie, she'll be answering questions that you have related to these subjects. And I'm going to be keeping an eye in the chat room and seeing what kind of questions you guys have. And if you guys have a question that can be answered right then and there, I'll interject and I'll, I'll ask it. But if it's something that can wait for the q and I'll write it down and I'll ask it later. So, Debbie, before we start talking a little bit more specifically about Goldie Blocks, I was wondering if you could just give us a definition of what you think product development is. Because we have some girls with us today who may be as young as 10, and they're between 10 and 19. And so it, it's really helpful to get just a really kind of plain language description of what product development is. Sure. So first of all, thanks so much for having me. I'm really glad I can share my story with you all uh, today. Uh, product development, uh, my definition for that would be really all of the work um, that goes into um, developing a product from its its earliest idea. So it might just be, you know, inkling of an idea, like, oh my gosh, wouldn't it be cool if such and such existed? Or, uh, oh, there's this problem that I face every day on my way to school that I wish I could solve. So starting from the initial concept and nugget of an idea all the way through to starting to sketch that out and come up with ideas and brainstorm with other people and get advice um, to starting to actually develop prototypes of that idea to um, taking those prototypes and testing them with people to see how they react and making improvements all the way to 
actually going into the final development of an actual physical um, or digital product that you would put out into the world. Neat. So can you tell us a little bit, for those who might not know, who Goldie is and how that character was developed? Sure. So the product development for Goldie Blocks, when it first started, it was actually, um, the concept was to solve a problem. And the problem is that there are very few female engineers. Uh, in the U.S., only 14% of engineers are women. And this was a stat that really bothered me, especially because I studied engineering at Stanford. And in many of my classes, most of, the, most of my classmates were male. And a lot of times I felt left out. And it always bugged me that there weren't more girls in my engineering classes, especially because a lot of the fastest growing jobs are in engineering. And engineering solves some of the world's biggest problems. And so we really need more girls and women involved in engineering. So when I was starting out with product development for Goldie Blocks, I was trying to solve that problem. How do we get more girls interested in engineering? And as I was talking with friends about it, um, one day actually a friend of mine talked about how she got interested in engineering. And it was sort of an unexpected answer. She told me that she got interested in engineering as a little girl because she played with all her older brother's construction toys. And that if it were up to her, she would have rather played with dolls. But she had three brothers, and they had so many construction toys in the house that her parents wouldn't buy her any dolls. So she just played with the construction toys. And she said that those toys made her interested in engineering. And from that day that we talked about it, it really kind of bugged me that um, so many construction toys you know, have a boy on the front of the box. And um, at the time, it was really thought of as a boy's play pattern. The boys play with construction toys and that girls play with dolls. And I thought, you know, maybe if I could make construction toys that girls would like playing with, that maybe then um, more girls might start building and tinkering from a young age, and maybe maybe they would start getting interested in engineering. We could solve that big, hairy problem that I wanted to solve. And so when I first got started, I was starting to sketch construction toys. But I was doing a bunch of research into the reasons why construction toys for so long have been so popular with boys. And what I found really early on in reading all of these articles about childhood development and spatial skills development and the brain and the differences between boys and girls, what I, what I found uh, article after article was very interesting. I read that girls really love stories and characters and reading and um, that most construction toys didn't have any story. It was just a bunch of pieces in a box with something to build on the front. And I started to think maybe there's an aha. Maybe if I could blend stories with building and create a character who's a girl engineer who builds stuff, um, that maybe then that would be a way to get girls who love stories and characters and reading so much interested in building and engineering. So I invented a girl engineer named Goldie. And when I first started drawing Goldie, I was really just doing kind of doodles. And I've always loved art, so this was very fun for me. And I started to think about who this girl Goldie might be. And I really kind of started imagining her to be this inventor, and she wears overalls and she has a tool belt with all the tools that she needs to build stuff and that she's very scrappy and she just runs around the house um, taking whatever she can find, a mop or a ribbon from a dress, you know, just very scrappy and resourceful that um, she would just come up with inventions. And I gave her gold hair because her name was Goldie and, you know, I just started drawing pictures of this girl. And that was, that was really how it started, was um, drawing these pictures and writing stories about 
what would Goldie build and what kind of problems would she solve and how would she help her friends. And um, in the very first story that I, I wrote about Goldie, I wrote a story about her having this dog named Nacho who's <laughs> always chasing his tail. And I thought, well, maybe I could teach young girls about how a wheel and axle works by having Goldie build a machine to spin Nacho around in circles. <laughs> so it was just a silly, simple little story, but I thought it was fun, and I thought it could just like it could be like a fun reason to learn about and build a wheel and axle. So what you're looking at right here are just some of my earliest sketches of Goldie and some of the early stories that I wrote. Neat. How did you take those sketches and develop them into sort of 3D or 2D models? So, um, so the next step was um, the process that I call, or that is called, rapid prototyping. So, writing and drawing the stories was a lot of work, but you know, it was really just me drawing with pencil on paper. And um, but but then I needed to take the story and also have the invention of what Goldie builds, and so. I needed a little dog character. I needed a nacho. And, um, you know, I didn't really have much money at the time to do this, so I just made a little nacho out of clay. Um, I don't know if you can see there, there's like a little brown and white clay figurine that I just baked in the oven, and suddenly I had a nacho. And I had other little characters too. I had a little uh, teddy bear, I had a Goldie. Um, you can see Goldie there with the blonde hair and a little baby and a little doll and a bird. And in, in yellow, you can see I was prototyping some cranks. And this was very, um, very quick, very easy for me to just um, start sculpting myself and just getting something that I can put in front of kids. Because what I wanted to do was test if kids could read the story and follow along and build along with Goldie. Neat. I also saw that. Um, oh yeah. Oh no, go ahead. Oh no, I was just really interested in some of the research you might have done to make some of the pieces in the next yeah. year. So then um, I wanted Goldie, uh, the character again. I wanted the idea of just taking what you have around the house and using it to build a machine. And so one of the ideas that I had was, well, if I want to make um, Nacho spin around in circles, I need a wheel. And I got like really interested in hair curlers um, well, because I have very curly hair. And I thought that'd be like kind of a funny thing to go grab from the house and use as a wheel to build something. So I, I did a ton of research into hair curlers and the whole evolution of hair curler design. And I was, you know, it's like the hair curlers on the left, you can see there's two different kinds, one that had holes going through and one that had spikes. Um, and like you know, different widths and um, and uh, different lengths and and so I actually went. Um, I would I would go out to um, flea markets or um, you know different uh, different used clothing uh, goodwill kinds of stores and just try to get as many hair curlers as I could. Um, which most of them I could just get for free because nobody really wants hair curlers anymore. So I was able to just start taking hair curlers and playing with them and experiment with them. Um, and that was my early prototyping to have a wheel. Neat. And I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about minimum viable product because some of the students are going to be working on apps and if they have so many features in their apps, um, it might detract from the kind of mission of the app. And I'm wondering if during your process of prototyping, you discovered that having fewer things might have been helpful or what is, you know, the bare minimum and how, what does that have to do with the whole process? Yeah, no, that's good. So minimum viable product um, is really important and I use that methodology for Goldie Blocks. Um, because at the beginning, when I was first starting, I had so many ideas. I actually thought, you know, I wanted it to be an app and a book. 
and I wanted to have Goldie as a, a figurine, like an, a, an action figure, and I wanted to have like all these different characters, and I wanted the book to be a flip book um, so that you could put it on the table and it would be easy to follow along. So there were all of these things that I wanted, but then when I got started creating it, I realized that there were a lot of limitations, and um, and ultimately I had to put out a product that I could sell, um, which I actually launched it on Kickstarter, but I needed to narrow down and just come up with what key features were just must have. Mm -hmm. And I had to put some of the other features that I wanted sort of on the back burner because, you know, if I tried to fit everything and get it to be perfect, um, it was either A, going to be too expensive, or B, going to take way too long and I didn't have enough time. So if you look at these pictures, these are some of my early prototypes where I was getting toward the path of a minimum viable product. So the one actually on the right um, is one of my first prototypes. And in this one, I was testing the idea of kind of this, you look and you build along um, as you read. And so I had built this frame that you would put the book inside and that along the story, Goldie would be spinning her characters on these wheels and you would uh, thread the ribbon across the page and see how different things spin. And um, in this one I was really excited about because I thought it was such a great idea. And then I tested it, started testing it um, on kids and right away I noticed the same thing happen over and over again, which was the kid would build along with the instructions and then they would want to turn the page and they would say well what do I do now and I would say well you have to take it apart so that you can turn the page and that was very frustrating because they had spent all this time putting the putting the contraption together they didn't want to take it apart and so um, that was a really great learning and I knew that that was you know something that couldn't go in the final product because everyone's getting so frustrated so I moved to the version on the left where I took the book separate and I created a play board, a pegboard where all the building would happen. So that was an early on big change that I made. Oh. Um, and then moving on to the next slide, this is sort of like showing the evolution. Um, once I had changed the board, uh, I started going into um, and I knew that that worked and having the story separate was really great. Um, I moved into going into manufacturing and that process was a big one because this was when I learned all of the limitations that there actually were and the board that I created which was a blend of foam and plastic, um, each hole had to fit the little axles perfectly and if you look on the left this is actually a real um, a document that I sent over to the manufacturer where I had to sit and every time they would make a board I would test every single hole and I wanted them all to be perfect fit which is green but you can see in this one um, they would send me a board and I would test each hole and I would send it back to tell them which holes they had to fix because they were either too um, really really tight, kind of tight, or a little bit tight. Um, so you can see there's a lot of back and forth that needed to happen, but the minimum viable product, um, at a minimum, all of the holes had to be the best fit. Um, but there were other things that I had to cut, like um, in the uh, minimum viable product, um, I had really wanted to have um, a Goldie um, figurine come with it, but it was going to end up being really expensive and um, to include her plus all the other stuff. So I and also I hadn't developed her yet and it was going to take a long time. So I decided to cut that because you didn't need it uh, for the finished product. Um, so that was the choice that I made. Whoa. So were there any, um, so you mentioned that these, some of them came back and the you know, they had to have the holes kind of adjusted and all that. Was there any sort of 
besides that set setback, were there any other setbacks that you were able to turn failure into a sort of learning experience? Yes, um, I actually, so we, um, we manufacture Goldie Blocks in China, and so right before we were going to produce our first run of all of the toys, I had to fly to China by myself and go to the factory, and I, I had already approved the board. We had sent it back and forth about 10 times, and we finally had all, all the holes just right, but I flew out there anyway just to be really sure. And when I got there, I took a board off the assembly line and I tested it to make sure it worked. And all the holes were way too tight. Oh. <laughs> and I was freaking out. Um, but luckily, we were able to figure out the problem. It wasn't that the, the holes were the problem. It was that those little pink axles had variation. And some of them were slightly... Um, slightly wider in diameter than others. Very, very slight. Uh, but if they were slightly too wide, they weren't going to fit. So we had to build a gauge that was basically like um, uh, basically a tool where you can pour all of the axles into it and there's a hole and the ones that are the right size fall through the holes and the ones that are too wide don't. And so we were able to fix the problem before we shipped them all. Oh. <laughs> so around when was that? Um, I'm just curious to know how long it took you from from getting to from your sketches to you know the the prototype to a sort of larger brand. So the first sketches happened in January of 2012. I got to a minimum viable product in um, September, wow. so um, about nine months to create a minimum viable product, um, and then it took an additional six months to get that product uh, manufactured and shipped. Wow. So I'm wondering, um, you, I think you had a Kickstarter campaign for all that didn't you? And how, how did that go for you? What was the process like having a Kickstarter campaign? The Kickstarter campaign was really great because um, before going on Kickstarter, I was talking with toy store owners, trying to see if they were interested in Goldie Blocks. But most of them didn't believe that girls liked building or that girls would like engineering. And so they sort of rejected the idea. Um, and so by going up on Kickstarter, it was really great because I was able to raise about two hundred and eighty-five thousand dollars on Kickstarter. Wow! Which was really helpful because I needed the money to make all those toys, and also it proved that actually there was demand for it, and that girls and their parents really wanted something like this. And then when the Kickstarter was so successful, all those toy stores called and they said, hey, we'd like to buy it. You know, we want to carry it in our stores. So um, it was really great. Um, it was a great way to prove the validity of the concept. Nice. I'm wondering if you can talk just for a few minutes on when you came up with the idea or your team came up with the idea to create an app to complement the product line. Yeah, well, we had this one toy that we made called the Movie Machine, and um, it was this really fun toy where um, we had this story about Goldie and her friends um, that discovering that the the film festival in their town, the Blockstown Film Festival, which is an annual tradition, got canceled because the projector was broken. And so Goldie, she's the inventor, and she's always trying to solve problems. And so she was determined to save the film festival with an invention. <laughs> and after they brainstormed for hours and hours, they came up with an idea to build a zoetrope. And um, a zoetrope is one of the first ever animation devices. It's basically a big hoop with slits, and when you... Um, and, and when you spin it around and look through the slits, 
you can create a moving picture. The most famous one is a running horse. Mm -hmm. And so we thought it would be really cool to build a zootrope out of our construction toy pieces and um, have kids follow along the story of, of Goldie saving the film festival and having them build their own zootrope and then making their own little movies to put in the zootrope. So we were working on this toy and then you know we thought well wouldn't it be really cool if there was an app where you could actually make movies digitally and then print them out to play in the Zotrope? And we all started to get really excited about this idea. And we thought it would also be a great way where we could tell our story um, in an app, which could hopefully reach even more people. Um, and um, so that was, that was the idea. And initially, when we concepted the app, we thought, well, we'll, we'll just make it like an ebook because we already wrote this book anyway. So we'll just make it an ebook, and then at the end, we could um, we could have kids make their own movies. Wow. And once we got into the development of the app, um, well, this could be a whole nother webinar, <laughs> but. Um, it was really fun and a really creative, fun project. It took a lot of time and energy. We made it really fast. We learned a lot. We made a million changes throughout the course of it because we were testing it a lot and learning so much as we went. So um, the app that we launched was entirely different than the first app that we had planned. <laughs> but it was very successful and in fact today um, kids have made over three million movies in the app Wow! Uh, which is really really cool and I make movies in it all the time it's really fun <laughs> so um, you know it was just a fun way to extend the play value of Goldie Blocks and also use the app as a way to get our brand and our characters in front of more kids um, and give them something fun to play with, even if they you know, don't have the toy, um, that they could still play and have fun with the app. That's neat. I'm wondering um, if you can talk a little bit about what you really love about um, having, you know, using mobile technology with your product line, because um, the girls are going to be developing apps, and one thing we really want them to focus on is using the features of mobile technology that are particular to that. So, you know, what value is added by by the features of a cell phone or a smartphone? Yeah, well, um, we really thought a lot about that when we made this app because we already had a really fun tactile building experience, but what it didn't have was, um, you know, we could we could have um, kids draw with pencil and paper movies to put into their zootrope, but the mobile technology has a camera that you can use. Mm -hmm. And so we wanted to take advantage of that. So we actually incorporated a photo tool where you could make photo movies if you wanted. And we incorporated drawing tools with all different paint colors because we were able to do that. Um, we created stamps, which you could drag and um, expand or, or make smaller and um, copy. Um, we also had moving backgrounds. And we also actually connected our app to our YouTube channel, where we had video tutorials with ideas of movies to make. Um, we also incorporated sound, because we could use sound in the app. and so. I don't know if anyone's ever seen the show Mythbusters, but we actually got Carrie Byron from Mythbusters to be the voice for our tutorials in the app. Neat. So there were just all these great things that we were able to do digitally that we just couldn't do in the toy, and we really wanted to take advantage of that. That's really neat. So I only have one last question for you, and then I'm going to open it up to our audience. And if you had any piece of advice to give, you know, a younger family member, say, or someone you care about who's a girl who wants to become an entrepreneur or work in the tech industry, what is that advice? 
my advice would just be to um, to not be afraid to share your ideas with people and get feedback. I think um, I think that when I was starting out at the beginning, sometimes I was afraid to tell people my ideas or I felt like I needed to do it all by myself. And it's just not true. I think the more that you get an idea down, even if you have an idea for an app and you don't totally know how to how to build it yet, maybe you're still learning how to code, you can just draw a picture of your idea on a piece of paper. And you can show it to somebody and you can get feedback. So um, I just think to not be intimidated, to be open to talking with other people, asking for advice, getting help, don't be shy. That's really the key, I think, to being successful in this field. And I would in, in really encourage girls to, to do it because we need more girls in it and girls are completely capable and, and they have different, sometimes very different ideas that are, that are really needed. Um, so, so don't be intimidated. Go for it, and always raise your hand if you don't know, um, because the worst thing you can do is be embarrassed, not admit if you don't know something. Don't be embarrassed. One of the questions that just came in is, how did you build relationships in a male-dominated profession? Um, you know, I think I think um, the biggest mistake that, that you can make sometimes is... Um, trying to act like somebody you're not in order to try and fit in. I think um, just being yourself is really important and um, and also trying to um, trying to find common ground. So finding things that you have in common. Um, you know, I'm not I'm not really much into sports or anything like that, but a lot of the men in my field I find something that we both like, whether it's a TV show or movie that we both like, or maybe we're both interested in the same political candidate. Like I, I always try to spend time to get to know anyone who I work with, um, whether it's male or female, and not feeling like, oh no, it's going to be all men, so I'm not going to fit in. Just figuring out ways to fit in while still being myself. I'm wondering if there's anyone, if there are any examples of women in your family who who are working in tech or, or in the art fields. And, you know, if you've thought over time how much different your experience is to theirs. Well, my grandmother was actually an animator for Disney, and um, she was uh, one of the creators of Mr. Magoo, and, which I don't know if anybody, probably all the girls on this are too young to know who that is. He I was... <laughs> A very famous cartoon character, and um, she also worked on Charlie Brown's Christmas, which maybe some of you have seen. But um, at the time, she was one of the only women in animation, and um, and I think about that a lot because I think that um, in those days it was even harder for women than it is now, and um, and I think you know a lot of times people. It actually bothers me because um, I, you know, my dad and my aunt um, have all of these great drawings that she did. My grandmother actually passed away before I was born, but they have all these great drawings that she did and awards that she won, um, sort of tucked away in boxes and stuff. Some of them hanging up, and um, people have come up to me and said, "Oh, well, your grandmother didn't create Mr. Magoo because I don't find it online." I searched it online and I don't see that. And, you know, it bugs me because I'm like, do you really think that women in those days got credit for what they invented? Uh, most of them did not. So, um, you know, that's it's different nowadays and we're, we're lucky to be in different times. Yeah. Um, we have a few more questions that have been rolling in. One is, um, are there any sources of inspiration you can recommend, like books? or anything like that? Yeah, I think um, what I would what I would recommend is um, whatever problem you're trying to solve or whatever issue you're passionate about, whether it's I'm looking for ways to communicate more with, you know, more with my friends and family or 
you know, I'm trying to solve, make it easier for people to find a, adopt a pet. Or, you know, in my case, I'm trying to make it easier for girls to get excited about engineering. Whatever that thing is, just go and do, read up on it as much as you possibly can. For, for Goldie Blocks, I, um, I learned so much by just reading every book and article that I could about the subject matter that I was interested in, which was the gender gap in engineering. And so for that particular um, focus area, I read articles from the American Association of University Women. Uh, the Girl Scouts has reports on this. I found books by neuroscientists um, about the male and female brain. I read pediatricians' books on the development of motor skills. I mean, those were the kinds of things that inspired me. I even went to the public library and I took out every book that I could about at-home science and engineering projects. And in fact, it was in one of those books that I got the inspiration to create a belt drive toy. So I would, I would just recommend when you're in those early stages, just go and think broad and just read and talk to as many people as you can because that's how you're going to get that that special kind of inspiration moment and it, it won't happen right it won't not gonna necessarily happen just from one book like it's going to happen from reading up on it and reading a bunch of stuff and going out in the world and looking in stores and taking pictures and scrapbooking and then all of a sudden you will have you will have read or thought of like seen the same idea like five times and then maybe the sixth time that you see it you're like oh that's a good idea we have two more questions that are pretty closely related to tech innovation curriculum and that's um what advice do you have for girls who are working on their paper prototype what tips do you have for gathering effective feedback from potential users well um I would, it depends on, I think usually the best way to get feedback is um, to put your prototype in front of people and let them talk. Um, sometimes, you know, you're very, you know, you know it's rough and you know there's things that you want to fix but you haven't really done it yet and so you're explaining, explaining, explaining and I think it's better if you just put it in front of them, let them talk and don't say anything. Um, because I think you'll get more out of it and you know I think that the other key thing when you're doing research with people is just consistently ask why why did you say that you know why you know they might say oh I don't get it well why what, what about it what don't you get specifically like trying to dig into why the why as much as you can will really get more deeply into what they're thinking um, so that would be my that would be my advice on on that. Don't feed them the answer and really let them do almost all the talking and ask ask why. We have another question that it's about expanding your network. So the question is, can you talk about your experience? What was it like in building a network in order to give your product visibility? Yeah, so um I think this kind of ties back to some of my advice from earlier, which is like really going out and getting as much feedback and advice and talking to as many people as you can while you're building it, I think is really critical. Um, because as soon as I started doing that, everything really changed for me. I found that the more people I talked to about what I was doing, um, some of them actually wanted to be involved. And I ended up actually finding people who volunteered their time to um, conduct research with me. Um, they had free time and they wanted to do it and they were excited about it and so I suddenly had help and um, and then they would reach out to people that they knew and every problem that we had or thing we didn't know how to do we just weren't afraid to go out and try and meet people and talk to whoever we could to find somebody who might be able to lend a hand. And um, and I've continued to do that to this day. And um, whenever I don't know something um, or I'm looking for guidance, I 
I look out and I just think, well, who would be the best person who, who knows this, who could help me? And I've never been afraid to reach out and try to get a hold of that person. And sometimes they're too busy or, you know, they maybe, you know, maybe they say no, but, um, or, but most of the time they'll be willing to meet with you. And maybe they don't have time, but they'll recommend five other people who have who might be good, and then you have to go talk to those people. And then very rarely, but this does happen too, you meet somebody who wants to spend a lot of time and who really wants to help you succeed, and they get very invested and very involved. And, um, and those are rare, and you don't find them until you've had, like, there's, you've had have, probably have a hundred meetings with people until you find the one person who's going to be like your biggest advocate and help you open so many doors, but it's worth it. You have talked to enough people because once you find those people, they can really help you. Oh, that's great. I think I have one last question and that is, was there ever anyone in your life who served as a mentor to you? And what advice would you have for girls in technovation who are seeking a mentor? Um, yeah, I've had plenty of mentors along the way, and they change because at the beginning, I remember um, one of my earliest mentors I actually found through a professional mentoring program. Um, there was a, a program that you could actually sign up and get matched a, a mentor. And so um, I got matched with this guy named Sam who had started a few companies and you know he was willing to meet with me like once a week for a couple hours and um, I just found him through a formal mentoring service and um, and it was great because he had extra time and he wanted to volunteer and he wanted to do it and I needed help and and um, it ended up being this really amazing mentorship where he helped me so much. He introduced me to so many people, and um, and then it got to the point where um, I, you know, my business was taking off, and um, he actually ended up becoming an investor in the company. Um, and now, you know, we keep in touch every now and then, but you know, he's not that involved anymore because. He was really helpful at the early days, at the beginning, and you know, once we figured all that out, then I moved on to different mentors who helped me at the next, the next stage. And um, sometimes you, you know, um, so there are, there are uh, places out there where you can actually find a mentor and get matched with people who volunteer and want to do this. And then other times, you can just find mentors by kind of what I was saying before, which is when you find look for people who can be helpful to you try to you know meet up with them for a cup of coffee or whatever and um, and sometimes one of those people will be very excited and it'll be feel natural and you'll start getting together all the time and they'll reach out to you and they'll ask questions and they'll want to be involved and again it doesn't happen every time. Most people that you meet with are busy and they won't get that involved, but some of them do. So you just have to meet with enough people that you find somebody who wants to be a mentor. Neat. Well, I'm going to echo what pretty much everyone is saying in the chat room, and thank you so much for your time. This has been pretty brilliant. People have even thought it's outstanding, and I'm really glad that you could spend some time with us today to talk about all these things because it's really important to the girls in our program that they have some positive kind of role models and women like you who are making such cool things for them to use their imaginations and build and design things. So it's pretty incredible. Um, so a huge thank you to you, Debbie. And for all the rest of you who are listening and still here, I'm going to be sending out an email with a recording link to this whole webinar and if you check the materials section in your control panel, you can also get the, the presentation here. And if this webinar was helpful as the one prior, I'd love for you guys to come back and join us for the next few ones. Um, we do have one in about a couple of weeks. 
with Ava Ho, who's on the board here at Iridescent, and she's going to be talking about revenue models. So that's where you guys should probably be in the curriculum at that point. And you can find out information about that on the Technovation website. And I just want to reiterate our thanks big time for coming. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm glad that it uh, was helpful. So thanks so much for having me. All right. Thanks to everybody. <laughs> Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye.